Welcome back to The Breakfast here on PLUS TV Africa. It's time for Today in History. And I'm going back to the year 1953. Uh, I'm going to be sharing a, uh, with you a, a short story about a man called Jomo Kenyatta, the father of current uh, Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta. Uh, he was born in uh, 1987 and, of course, uh, died in uh, 1978. He was a Kenyan anti-colonial activist and politician who governed Kenya uh, as its prime minister from 1963 to 1964, and then as its first president from 64 to his death in 1978. Uh, of course, I mentioned the father to the fourth uh, Kenyan president, Uhuru Kenyatta. Uh, and I'm sharing today about the day he was arrested for leading the Mau Mau uprising from 1952 to 1960. Uh, it's also known as the Mau Mau Re Rebellion, and it was a war with, it, with the British Kenyan colony from 1920 to 1963 between what was called the Kenya Land and Freedom um, Army, KLFA, and, of course, the British authorities. The KLFA, of course, in that war and in that revolution had failed to capture widespread public support. Um, um, and, of course, um, you know, unfortunately, they kind of lost the war. But all of that led to Kenya being granted independence um, a year later after the war ended. Uh, one of the reasons that it is rumored that they lost the war was because of a certain British policy. That, and I'm going to mention this because it's very, very similar to what happened here in Nigeria. Uh, the divide and rule policy was what the British used back then in the 60s to weaken the support that the Mau Mau Rebellion had. And that's how they eventually lost the war. The number of deaths attributed to the uh, emergency or to the uh, period was between 25,000. Some people say as much as 50,000 deaths in the Mau Mau Rebellion. Um, of course, um, Jomo Kenyatta remained in prison after he was arrested uh, until 1959. And then he was exiled to Lord War in 1961. When he was released, he became president of the uh, KNU which was their uh, political party then, and then led the party to victory in 1963, oversaw the transition, of course, as prime minister, oversaw the transition of the Kenyan colony into an independent republic, which he then became president of in 1964. And so he was arrested in 1953, exiled in 1959, or rather released in 1959, um, and then, of course, uh, became uh, prime minister um, after his release and after he came back to the country in 1963 and then president after Kenya's independence in 1964. So he has played a very, very, very major role in Kenyan history from being a freedom fighter into seeing Kenya's independence and, of course, freedom from the British you know, colonization. And, of course, then also becoming president until 1978. The Kenyatta family has you know, over time produced two presidents. Uh, the current president of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, took over in, 19, in 2013 and is uh, still president of Kenya. But today we're talking Jomo Kenyatta. Yes, Jomo Kenyatta. Interesting story. You know, just a few similarities between him and Mandela um, with regards to the fact that he went to prison and then became president. You know, that's, that was just that. Yeah, sadly that uh, the Namamao uprising I really don't know how they made that connection, but we know how vocal he was against the British colony, against British rule. And there was even a quote that he made, very popular quote. Uh, he said, when the missionaries arrived, the Africans had the land, missionaries had the Bible. They taught us how to pray with our eyes closed. When we opened them, they had our land and we had the Bible. That's Jomo Kenyatta for you. So he was just against, you know, colonialism. He wanted, you know, self-determination for, you know, the Kenyan nation. Eventually got it, eventually became president yeah. and uh, sadly passed away. And it's, um, you know, not the first time that, you know, we're hearing of a tactic called divide and rule and divide and conquer, mm -hmm. um, which has been apparently, you know, is the British policy and is their, you know, regular tactic if they need to, you know, win a battle or divide a people mm -hmm. or to win, you know, um, over a people, you know, divide you with religion, with, you know, um, uh, tribe and with politics and the likes. And, you know, people have also said that's about the same thing that was done here in Nigeria. 
uh, that weakened the unity that should have given Nigeria, you know, more um, uh, bite, you know, give us, you know, a fighting force. But unfortunately, it didn't work. Uh, so it's not the first time British have used that same policy. It worked in Kenya also. Um, but the positives from that is after the Mau Mau rebellion and revolution, they eventually achieved independence in 1964, uh, 1963 or 64. All right. All right, so the next story for today in history would be about someone that we can't forget in a hurry in history. She's popularly known as the Iron Lady, and we're talking about Margaret Thatcher. Well, it was this day in history, April 8th, 2013, that Margaret Thatcher, Britain's first female prime minister, passed away. Uh, she had stroke. On April 8, 2013, she passed away and more than 2,000 guests from around the world attended her funeral, which occurred in uh, St. London, St. Paul's Cathedral. She served as Prime Minister of Britain from 1979 to 1990, and Thatcher was the longest serving British Prime Minister of the 20th century. She was nicknamed the Iron Lady. She was, you know, credited by her admirers with championing free market, you know, conservative policies that revitalized the British economy. In 1959, Thatcher was elected to the House of Commons and uh, she rose through her party ranks. And when the Conservatives came into power, you know, under Edward Health in 1970, she was named Secretary for Education. She was the first woman to serve as opposition leader in the House of Commons. She left the House of Commons in 1992, and uh, her, her, her reign basically generated lots of uh, criticism from some conservative politicians. And uh, interesting things about uh, Margaret Thatcher is that she used to be a scientist, you know. Even though she said she already had it in mind that long term she was going to go into politics, but she really was a scientist, and she was developing you know, ice cream recipes, but she said... She became bored staying in the laboratories for a long time. That she wanted to, you know, meet the people. She wanted to be with the people, you know, for longer. And that's how she got into politics and uh, became the longest, you know, serving prime minister. And when she when she passed on in the year 2013, her ashes was actually uh, buried uh, at the Royal Hospital in Chelsea. They were laid next to the rest of those of her husband, you know, when she passed away at the age of 80. Seven. Margaret Thatcher reminds me of, of Thatcher. You know the Thatcher I'm talking about? No, she doesn't remind me <laughs> What I'm trying to say Thatcher. is her Sorry. fierce, Thatcher's fierce personality, really. <laughs> Still no. That's why she took the name. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, no. They even spell totally different. No, Annette, well, I don't know. Well, it's the pronunciation I'm talking about. Come on, please. You, you, can, you can definitely modify, <laughs> modify spellings oh, as you like. Oh, Lord have mercy. But that uh, Margaret Thatcher died today, uh, the 8th of April 2013. Okay, all right. Uh, it, you know, once again reinforces the uh, conversation on women in politics, women in governance, mm -hmm. you know, female prime ministers. Uh, Jacinda Ardern, uh, the uh, prime minister of uh, New Zealand currently is, you know, doing phenomenally. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's been far, far, far back in history that we've, you know, always started to see women do exceptionally well in those positions. Um, and I would always say ignore some of the bad examples because when you mention women in politics, you know, there's always people who would um, wake up from sleep and say, oh, what of this one who stole or what of this one who you know, was corrupt? The men were exactly. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's great that we continue to have these women, you know, um, examples, these female examples. Uh, the, the world needs to continue to find ways to create, you know, that space. Um, and at the same time, women themselves need to, you know, find ways to get into that space. No one is just going to give it to you. Yes, I'm talking about change for, for the next presidential elections in Nigeria. I'm yet to see like a powerful female voice coming out that you would kind of guess that maybe this person might run in 2023. I'm, I'm yet to see that, but maybe it's too soon to judge. Well, I think it's, 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 it's being um, honest with ourselves that it doesn't seem like we're there yet as a country. Um, we haven't been able to develop our political space and our electoral system well enough to be able to give every single person a fair chance, um, especially women, you know, with regards, you know, the way that Nigerians even act towards women in politics and women in governance. Uh, so we're not there yet. And so a lot of people, well, females who might consider it, um, would always need to, would always be discouraged, really, by facing the reality of where we are politically and with our um, electoral system. Well, really, uh, the when amount are we of money to be there also, yet? I, I really don't I, know. If, I, if, if there are women who feel they can definitely 
definitely create the change that we need in Nigeria. And they have the... How many women vote? Political support. Even. My point is, let them just try. You know, you can't just say, when is the right time? Nothing wrong with trying. And it's not, it's not really about, you know, um, when, it, yeah, when is the right time? Great, but... I mean, um, look at, look at, I, look at I'm, Tanzania. I'm, I'm very sure she never imagined to ever become president, maybe. Yeah, you know, I'm, but, I'm but really talking, happened, so. you know, about facing the reality of where we are today and also um, developing the mindset of Nigerians with regards to you know, the electoral process. How can we have a, a, a better electoral process that assures every single person that um, you know, runs for election that they will get a standing and a fair chance as long as they campaign properly? How many women actually get into, to vote in, into the, to the police station? How many women really are registered to vote? Um, how many of these women also, you know, were bold enough to say, yes, we will go out there and contest? Mm -hmm. How expensive really is, you know, the electoral process? How many people can afford, you know, campaigning in Nigeria and running for, you know, elective position in Nigeria? I completely support it, you know, but at the mm -hmm. same time, let's also remember that it is also great that we, you know, get women to also... Um, or everybody to start at the you know smallest level. Just try yes. try with local government offices. Even yes, if that yeah. oneself is still politicized to a level where a lot of people believe that those things aren't really done by elections. They are given by whoever is governor, House of Assembly, seems State like, House of Assembly. It seems like appointments and all of that. Exactly. Election. The State House of Assembly, the you know councillorship, the local government chairman, um, permanent secretaries, the House of Representatives, you know, those levels can also be filled up by women. A lot of decision making, you know, takes place in those levels. It doesn't have to be an asshole all the time. That's why you need women in the high positions, because it's only when you have women who are thinking of women that would be able to make the, 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 the parts of politics that involves appointment. It's women that would be able to sit and think, let's get more women who are qualified into these positions. So whether it's from the grassroots, whether it's from the big leagues, we just need women in politics in Nigeria. Oh, so, so, so it's a whole conversation on its own. But that's all we have for you um, today in history. I went back to 1953 and told you about Jomo Kenyatta, one of the founding fathers of what we have today as uh, Kenya. Yes, and I told you about uh, Margaret Thatcher, who passed away this day in history, 2013, shining the lights and blazing the trail for all women to follow. All right. Stay with us. We're moving into our first major conversation for today. Banditry, kidnapping, and all of the insurgency and insecurity challenges we're having in Nigeria. The conversation about who is sponsoring these persons and these insurgents. Who is sponsoring these kidnappers and these bandits? The Nigerian government claims to know and, of course, has threatened or made mention of revealing some of these names. But are we genuine and are we serious about this conversation? We'll talk about it next with uh, former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, uh, Obadiah Meilafia, coming up next. <laughs> 